June. So I'm just saying, oh, well, we should have a ribbon cutting ceremony. I'm not meaning this literally. <laughs> so like two weeks ago, Daddy pulls up. <laughs> Okay, welcome everybody. We want to get going because we want to get outside and have merriment and wine. <laughs> um, I think most of you know I'm Deborah McDowell and I'm the director of now the Department of African American Studies. Uh, this is a red letter day for us. Uh, we have had quite a few red letter days in the last couple of years, frankly. Um, but today holds a special significance uh, among those days in the past, mainly because we are celebrating our new status as, a, as an academic department. We could not have reached this milestone without the assistance, the support, the goodwill of many, many people, too numerous to name. Uh, but let me attempt nevertheless to recognize a few people, some who could be here, others uh, who could not. Welcome. Uh, no, no problem. While you're settling, when we were expanding into this room that we had been coveting for a while, we thought there should be a door right there. You know, wouldn't it make a lot of sense to have a door? People could come in. Well, we couldn't have a door. We just said, we'll take the room if we can't have the door, but people come in <laughs> anyway. You, you can't have everything, but the, a door would work right there. You know, easy in, easy out. Uh, but anyway, that's another story. All right. Um, I want to recognize the students, um, many of whom I never knew, uh, who well over 40 years ago began to agitate for a department. As we all know, students uh, universally uh, spur, gold, pressure, uh, and demand from university administrations what they need. Sometimes those demands are met, sometimes they are not. Uh, sometimes it takes a long time for them to, to be met, but uh, I have to acknowledge that long before I ever set foot on the grounds of the University of Virginia, uh, behind me and many of us were those people who thought that uh, this unit should be recognized as an academic department. All of the staff members who supported them, uh, I can definitely thank the staff members today. Now they've ducked out of the room <laughs> have me. <laughs> standing before a big red ribbon with outside scissors. But that is just um, um, an example uh, or reflection of the investment that our staff have in, uh, staff members have in what we do. Um, and those staff members that I didn't work with specifically, but I remember Gail Shirley Warren uh, and Mary Rose, again, these are, they were stalwart uh, staff members in the Woodson uh, Institute. Um, faculty members present and past. Uh, I would just like for everybody who is a member of the faculty or faculty affiliates of Woodson to please stand uh, and be recognized, all right? <laughs> And I would simply ask you to state your names and just your, <laughs> go ahead. Hey, starting with you, Andrew. Uh, hi, I'm Andrew Carl. I'm here at the Woodson Institute in the History Department. Hi, I'm Kim Ford Measuring, I'm at the law school. Helen Kakini Marava, Anthropology Department. 
Nalini Chakramorthy in English. Derek Alwards, Curry School of Education. Kwame Ochi Woodson. I'm Gertie Chudson. Ashad Crowley, um, Woodson in Religious Studies. Marlena Dow Woodson, and American Studies. Sabrina Pendergrass, Woodson in Sociology. Um, Preston Reynolds, Woodson, and the School of Medicine. Uh, thank you all. I'd like to recognize Ashan and Marlena as our newest additions uh, to the faculty. All right. And a comrade <laughs> in these wars is um, Charlotte Patterson, <laughs> who is chair of the Department of Studies in Women, Gender, and Sexuality. Uh, it, it, which unit became a department uh, last year, all right. Um, so we are the two most recent of the interdisciplinary programs to become departments. Um, I want to recognize uh, uh, also <laughs> another faculty affiliate, Carmenita Higginbotham <laughs> from the art department. Uh, whom I always like to say is indentured to the Woodson Institute, <laughs> who always comes when called. <laughs> and um, with you, Carmenita, is um, Calvin, Purnell. Ca Calvin Purnell. Calvin, I meant to tell you, did you have an uncle who taught physics in a high school in Alabama? <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, you, you look just like Mr. Parnell, who taught me physics in ninth grade. <laughs> I meant to tell you that the other day. Anyway, um, uh, I think that um, I could not end these brief remarks without mentioning the person who actually founded this institute, and that is Armstead Robinson, um, whose vision uh, was really very, very strong and whose vision we try to honor each day um, we, as we go about our work. Um, Armstead thoroughly believed that the fellowship program could serve as a conduit into the faculty, and we have been able to realize one of that, one of the original objectives of the Institute uh, over the years. And again, most recently, uh, Kwame O2 comes to us directly from the fellowship program. Uh, and um, there are others I could name who are not here, but to keep things moving, um, I'll say that is we, that along with many other aspects of Armstead's vision, including that it, this would one day become a department, we have uh, dedicated ourselves to realizing. Uh, Reginald Butler. <laughs> Uh, who was the director for 10 years following Armstead's un untimely death. Scott French, who was also interim director for a number of years. Cynthia Haler Faton, who deeply regrets she couldn't be here today, um, who was interim director for a year. Uh, all of these people must be acknowledged. You can probably tell that I grew up in some tradition, some lapsed religious tradition because everybody has to be named. <laughs> you know? Everybody has to be named. You can either name yourselves or you have to be named. If you did nothing but bring the programs up from the basement and put them on the podium, uh, somebody, and here we will recognize little mistress Deborah McDowell who brought up the programs <laughs> from the basement. <laughs> so, you know, this is just how we do. Everybody must be acknowledged, everybody must be credited because everyone is essential to what we all recognize is a collaborative effort. To the, ex to, the, to the degree that we succeed at anything, we succeed with the help of many, many people. As I say, named and unnamed, and as many as you can name, the better. <laughs> okay. Um, finally, I would recognize uh, Ian Baucom, who could not be here, our current dean, and Francesca Fiorani, the associate dean, who may be joining us uh, later, uh, who actually uh, pushed uh, to have us um, become a department. From the very moment he arrived, Dean Baucom made it clear that our transition from program to department was long overdue. He knew that an academic program is universally regarded as synonymous with secondary status. 
signaling that African American and African studies as fields of study um, um, needed uh, to have autonomy that they didn't enjoy at that time. So without needing to impanel a committee or a report, he put the weight and authority of his office and considerable resources toward moving us in this direction. A move meant to establish once and for all that these fields are as fundamental to the lifeblood of the liberal arts at the University of Virginia and anywhere else in the American Academy as are English, history, sociology, politics, economics, I could go on. In doing so, he recognized simultaneously that such centrality could not be more critical than now when we are called, not just as a university, but as a nation, indeed as a globe, to deal with the perdurable and significant effects of race, social and structural inequalities, and intractable forms of injustice. The Department of African American and African Studies has been a long time coming, but we have not reached the promised land. Much work as well as much more agitation remains to be done, but we are accustomed to struggle. We have not been languishing all these years as we waited for the officials of our university to catch up with what many people already knew. And that is that the Carter G. Woodson Institute has long lent luster to the University of Virginia, due in large measure to the fellowship program, our first reason for gathering this afternoon. Since its inception in 1981, this program has awarded both pre- and postdoctoral fellowships from fiercely competitive international applicant pools, uh, selecting a diverse group of young scholars from disciplines in the humanities and social sciences whose research covers a wide array of topics in African American and African diasporic studies. Over the course of its 36-year history, the Institute has sponsored approximately 220 fellows whose work has appeared in numerous books and articles published by the foremost university presses and academic journals. And in cases too numerous to name, these books and articles have been awarded the most coveted and prestigious prizes that academia bestows. Now. <laughs> Now, I could appear to be engaging in, un, in an unseemly form of boasting and chauvinism, but because I can't take credit for very much of this, I can take credit for some, I can boast. So I would just point you to these covers. We are very happy about our practice of laminating the book covers of work we have supported. Uh, we have had no uh, shortage of Bancroft Prize winners among us. Uh, Talitha LaFloria's Chained in Silence has won every prize that every field and subfield of history awards uh, historians, and the list goes on. So this is just a fraction of the work that we have supported over the 36 years of our existence, and this work has indeed been transformative in the intellectual landscape uh, of the academy. Woodson Fellows are known, among other reasons, for being trendsetters. Wherever, wherever the scholarly landscape shifts and turns in new and innovative directions, in whatever field or subfield, there you will generally find a Woodson Fellow. You will meet some of them this afternoon uh, or this latest cohort, returning second year fellows and first year fellows, both pre and postdoctoral. Please join me in welcoming them. They will talk to you very briefly about their work and then we will repair to the lobby to eat, drink, and be merry, all right? Our first uh, fellow is Tiffany Barber. Uh, <laughs> Tiffany Barber just defended <laughs> her dissertation at the University of Rochester uh, in visual and cultural studies. Help me, my brain just froze at that point. All right. And Hello everyone. So good to see so many faces in the audience, new and old. Um, 
As Dr. McDowell said, I'm Tiffany Barber. I'm a second year pre-doctoral fellow here um, at the Carter G. Woodson Institute. My former home institution now hmm, is the University of Rochester in the Department of Art, art and Art History. Um, I just completed my PhD in Visual and Cultural Studies, which is crazy and feels very weird to say out loud and so in front of so many people, but it did happen. <laughs> and so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my project um, as it's been evolving since I've been here um, in the last year. On July 27, 2017, in a room full of video cameras and white men, U.S. Congresswoman Maxine Waters made a radical statement at the House Financial Services Committee meeting. Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin was testifying before the committee about the state of the international finance system when Waters, the committee's ranking Democrat and one of only 20 black women in the 535 member Congress, asked Nukin why his office had not responded to a letter from her and her colleagues regarding President Trump's financial ties to Russia. Nukin deflected, attempting to run out the clock on her questioning with platitudes and compliments. It did not work. <laughs> Waters would go on to repeat her statement, reclaiming my time, over and over during a two and a half minute span, a video clip of which went viral and spawned everything from hashtags to memes to an original gospel song. <laughs> More than a rejection of uselessly meandering meetings and draining social interactions, Waters' reclamation of time effectively broke the internet, making her the center of public discourse concerning the myriad micro and macro aggressions black women encounter in and beyond the workplace. Two and a half weeks after the Maxine Waters incident, artist Carol Walker made an equally radical rejection of the protocols that constrain identity-based artistic practices. Carol Walker is one of the most popular prolific artists of our time, and her latest spectacle, a press release and artist statement for her September 2017 exhibition of new paintings at her New York gallery, generated a string of commentaries in the news and on social media. The perspectives range from valorizing the artist for her bravery and confronting systems of oppression and remaining committed to artistic freedom, to also dissatisfaction and, dis and dissent directed at the artist's refusal to stand up and be counted as a black woman artist in the midst of present day social and political upheaval. It's too much, she declared, knowing full well, she goes on to say, that my right, my capacity to live in this godforsaken country as a proudly raced and urgently gendered person is under threat by random groups of white male supremacist goons who flunt a, a kind of patched together notion of race purity with flags and torches and impressive displays of perpetrator as victim sociopathy. Significantly, the aftermath of the Unite the Right rally here in Charlottesville, Virginia, along with the violence and public debate about white supremacy that it mobilized both nationally and internationally, should, according to her most recent cohort of detractors, urge Walker to make art that is revelatory and reparative in light of these events. These latter views are steeped in a politics of racial and gender representation that Walker has been contesting since her first solo show at the Drawing Center in New York in 1994. Despite the fact that Alison Calhoun, Walker's personal assistant, has said that the artist's 2017 statement was indeed a response to the events in Charlottesville, and that Walker is well known for pointing up the limits of art's potential to repair historical trauma, critics and fellow artists still desire her work to salve the long history of racial strife in the US. However, she refuses, then and now, to account for social and aesthetic expectations regarding what black women and their art can and should do. I know what you all expect from me and I have complied to a point, she tells us. But frankly, she continues, I am tired, tired of standing up, being counted, tired of having a voice, or worse, being a role model. She instead rolls her eyes, folds her arms, and waits. Five years after the emergence of the Black Lives Matter hashtag, seven months after the end of the first black U.S. president's two terms, and halfway into Donald Trump's increasingly sensational occupation of the White House, Waters and Walker's social interjections represent a fever pitch. As their strategies of refusal demonstrate, black women have historically been constrained by protocols of behavior, reproductive value, and aesthetics in the public and private sphere. In the art world, these protocols materialize in expert and lay expectations that black artists address their work to slavery and its legacies in order to affect racial healing and empowerment. 
My project, however, forces a distinction between black women's work as visual artists and art's capacity to mitigate historical trauma. Specifically, my project queers representational norms that conscript, conscript black women's physical and creative work into caregiving endeavors believed to beget self-determination and social transformation. Thus, linking black women's artistic production with 21st century demands for racial healing goes beyond contemporary art discourse to highlight the impact of gendered labor on blackness and its persistent visualization. Contrary to healing racial wounds, insisting on visibility and inclusion, or, or producing self-affirming images, I argue that the creative act in the hands of Kara Walker, Wangeshi Mutu, Xaviera Simmons, and performance artist Narcissister holds open the gaps of the past, of identity, of difference, to revel in a certain lack of mastery, power, and knowing the way forward. Ultimately, my project calls into question social and aesthetic norms regarding what black female figures can and should do, contesting, thereby contesting the nature of racial progress in the post-civil rights era. Considering the US political climate, ongoing gen racial and gender violence, and debates about the relationship between art and social protests, I believe this work is particularly urgent. Thank you. And now it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Lindsay Buton. Hello, thank you all so much for being here. I'm Lindsay Buton, and I am um, a doctoral student at the University of Pennsylvania in the Communication School, and I'm also a second year pre-doc here. Um, and I just have to say, I have so much gratitude and love for the Carter G. Woodson Institute um, and for our fearless leader, Professor McDowell. Um, it's been a complete honor and a joy um, to be a part of this group. So let's start with a story. In 1999, an international convention of African and African diaspora advocates issued a demand to the West for $777 trillion to be paid as reparations for slavery and colonialism. Media coverage curiously linked the demand to issues of modern day slavery, stating, quote, contrary to widespread belief, Slavery is still practiced in some parts of Africa, including Sudan and West Africa, end quote. 16 years after that reparations declaration, UK Prime Minister David Cameron was publicly pressed to address the issue of paying reparations for slavery to Jamaica during a trade relations diplomatic visit. Cameron dismissed the demands by stating via spokesperson, quote, the UK government abhorred slavery and indeed had passed the Modern Slavery Act to tackle human trafficking today, end quote. It would, however, offer 25 million pounds to build a new prison in Jamaica. In the intervening period, the discourse that human trafficking is, quote, modern day slavery, has gained widespread legitimacy and popularity across philanthropic, museological, policy, news, and international development spheres which strikes me as strange. Why would this cause, this particular use of the word slavery, be so readily championed by governments and philanthropists alike? My dissertation, If Slavery's Not Black, The Stakes of Anti-Trafficking Campaigns, argues that by naming a new modern slavery, i.e. human trafficking, amid the persistent material and symbolic effects of historic racial slavery, liberal state and non-state actors appropriate black suffering in order to solve a variety of political problems in the interest of capital. Anti-trafficking actors address problems such as lack of jobs, globally driven down wages, harsh migration controls, uneven development, and refugee crises with solutions like increasing border control, increasing investment in prison and police across the globe, racial profiling, advancing market-based solutions to humanitarian crises, and delegitimizing demands for reparations for slavery. Drawing on Africana studies, I demonstrate that anti-trafficking advocates reproduce the exclusions they try to solve because their pro proposed solutions are congruent with, rather than disruptive to, the underlying structures that produce unsafe migration in the first place. What's more, anti-trafficking campaigns predominantly promote the figure of the white savior, 
always a 19th century abolitionist, never an enslaver, which serves to advance the myth of white historical innocence amid demands for accountability for past wrongs. So my research is motivated by a burning question. Why are reparations for slavery so controversial? The question emerges from an archive of my own experiences, fundraising for black history museums, community organizing in the tobacco fields of North Carolina, and growing up with Jesse Jackson on the Chicago Nightly News. This archive, refracted through critical ethnic studies and media studies, has fostered a rich set of empirical research questions. How do discourses that support asymmetries of power gain legitimacy through liberalism? How does anti-blackness operate flexibly across differently racialized figures? I employ the methods of media ethnography and visual discourse analysis, analysis to interpret materials from four sites, US anti-trafficking policy documents, the visual culture of the NGO Free the Slaves, the human trafficking exhibition at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati, and CNN and The Guardian's philanthropic journalism platforms that cover human trafficking exclusively. My analysis focuses on where and how historic imagery of racial chattel slavery and 19th century abolition appears in these sites and to what political ends. I pay special attention to historically contingent moments when black political demands based in histories of slavery, such as reparations and bail reform, cross paths with anti-trafficking advocates and their campaigns. Finally, to counter what I see as the negative impacts of the anti-trafficking discourse, I propose that the field needs a reparations framework for thinking, to borrow Deborah Thomas's formulation, to shift both material and symbolic anti-black violence and the contemporary conditions that lead to unsafe migration. We need to sufficiently address and understand the impact of the past colonial and slave relation on the current global distribution of wealth, power, and borders, which is to say, repairing the past is a more effective way to secure freedoms in the future. Thank you. And now I get to introduce Lindsay Jones and Miss Lola Ruth, our newest uh, member of the Woodson family. <laughs> Good afternoon. So my, my apologies for, um, for all the, the interruptions from our little person here. Um, but I will, I will be brief. My name is Lindsay Jones. I am a second year pre-doctoral fellow at the Carter G. Woodson Institute. My home institution is UVA. My home department is Social Foundations of Education in the Curry School of Education. And my advisor is actually here, Derek Allridge. Um, so I have the, the pleasure of, of working pretty close to home here at the Woodson and I've enjoyed every minute of it. So um, as a Social Foundations of Education scholar, I focus in on the history of African American education particularly in the 20th century. And one question that has always driven my inquiry into this field is uh, the question of African-American educational self-determination. What is it that black people have, have done on their own in contexts where state and national governments haven't guaranteed African-Americans a right to education? Um, this question has, has led me in the case of my dissertation research, to examine the education of black girls labeled by courts across the state of Virginia as juvenile delinquents um, in the 20th century. So my dissertation is called Not a Place of Punishment, the Virginia Industrial School for Colored Girls, 1915 to 1940. It examines the state's first and only reformatory for black girls labeled delinquent who were committed to the school from courts across the state of Virginia. So this, the school illustrates for me um, the intersection of African-American educational self-determination in the case of the agency of black women who came together to found this institution on the one hand, and then on the other hand, state control. So I look at this school as um, an instance of where the, the educational motives and agenda of black women who were organized to, to improve the life chances of black girls intersected with oftentimes the, the controlling imperatives of the state. And so um, I, 
sorry. <laughs> I'm very distracted. Um, okay. I'm sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to wrap this up. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry, everyone. I am emerging from survival mode. I've successfully kept an infant alive for four weeks. <laughs> it's hard to do anything while she's crying. Poor thing. So um, the main question that my dissertation is seeking to answer is, what did it look like to be a girl in trouble in mid 20th century Virginia or in interwar Virginia? So I look at how national conversations around reform, around sexual delinquency, around black female juvenile sexual delinquency in particular, informed the experiences particularly of urban African American girls in the state of Virginia. How were they viewed by the state? How were they racialized, criminalized, subjected to um, definitions of delinquency that sought to control rather than ultimately reform them? So in addition to looking at how the state operated upon these girls, I also look at how the women of the Virginia State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs, which founded the reformatory I study, um, operated to seek out reform goals in the case of, of these girls and improve their life chances. Ultimately, I find, I'm so sorry. Um, Uh, the, the more progressive aims of the women who founded this institution, including things like um, giving girls an education and improving their occupational mobility, were often trumped by the, the aim of the state government of Virginia, which was to uh, reinforce the, the rigid racial and, and gender hierarchy within the state. Um, and so, I'm so, so sorry. Um, I have to wrap up, but, um, okay, I'm sorry, you guys, um, I have to wrap up, but I, I will introduce my colleague, Chinwei Origi. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Chinwei Origi. Um, my home institution is U University of Texas at Austin. African and African Diaspora Studies Department. And thank you so much for coming here and just taking out your time to learn more about our work. And so my dissertation is entitled, Race in Africa, Africa as Diaspora, Racialization of Post-Independent Nigerians in the US. So through an ethnographic study of Nigerian communities in Houston, Texas, I utilize critical race and African diaspora theorization to demonstrate the necessity in incorporating post-independent Africans within a framework of diaspora, sorry, with the uh, framework of diaspora theorization, while simultaneously emphasizing the need to center global racial structures as an analytical framework in African studies and immigrant sociology. So what I do is I argue that post-independent Nigerians in Houston, Texas, must be studied within a frame of a global anti-black racialization that takes in it into consideration both local and global structures, how that in impacts their position in society. So I aim to rework African diaspora theory to incorporate Nigerian diasporas in the US through the process of racialization that begins continent continentally in Africa and nationally in Nigeria. So theories of African diaspora are usually on a premise that defines diaspora through chattel slavery and the racial trauma thereafter. So what this does is it leaves post-independent Africans outside the purview of theorization. So Africa becomes an essentialized and imagined past that has no contemporary significance in diaspora studies. Post-independent Africa and her inhabitants are therefore left, left without a diasporic framework to interrogate their racial terror on and off the continent. So in turn, each chapter, I introduce new ways of theorizing black African identity, mobility, and black inter-ethnic solidarity. So in this vein, I use ethnographic accounts to introduce a new theoretical framework called black African ethnic symbolic mobility to understand how post-independent in, um, Africans incorporate in the US racial order. So through black African ethnic symbolic mobility, I argue that aligning the perceived social economic mobility of black Africans, specifically Nigerians, with their culture or values is a false depiction that's only functional to 
a symbolic ethnicity of the black African, leading to a situa situational elevation of status. So it also considers that these narratives of success can be very detrimental because they further marginalize generational black groups and ignore that black Africans are incorporated in a subordinate nar narrative of blackness based on their racialized position on the continent of Africa and in the US. And this is sustained through uh, continual effects of colonization, immigration, slavery, and imperialism. So also I introduce a process of rhetorical black into ethnic solidarity that I've termed obligated blackness, a key impetus to engage in a rhetoric of solidarity for some of my interlocutors is their personal experience of over anti-black racism. So these violent encounters tend to shake their foundation of their perceived ethnic shield and transition to realization that being an ethnic other would never be sufficient to, to surpass white supremacy. So in turn, I assert that the, the, vali the validity of my interlocutor's black solidarity through obligated blackness is limited to the, to the impossibility of their ethnic shield. So I question this form of solidarity because it's bent on a hidden desire to be this racialized ethnic other and realizing that this racialized ethnic other cannot save us. And we use that in order to hide from challenging white supremacy. So therefore this blackness, specifically the US permutation of it, overlaps with gen blacks, becomes more of an obligation through interpolation, hardly an identity of affinity through self-making. So overall, I'm developing a dissertation that disrupts, no, disrupts normative discourse on race and individual and collective racial identity for this population, standing at the intersection of race, African immigration, and the African diaspora. Thank you. <laughs> And next, we're going to have Seth Palmer to come on up. Um, so my name is Seth Palmer. I'm a PhD candidate coming for, to you from uh, the University of Toronto in the Department of Anthropology. Um, and I am also a first year predoctoral fellow here at the Woodson Institute. My dissertation right now is titled, uh, In the Image of a Woman, Sarambavi Subject Formation and Embodied Interpolation Along the Beitsi Buka River. It's an ethnographic account of the lives of Sarambav in northwestern Madagascar. The word Sarambavi is a compound word which literally refers to in the image of a woman. Um, and more, specific, more broadly, in, in Malagasy, it's referring to people who are both gender nonconforming and or um, same-sex desiring and male-bodied. My project attends to the hermeneutical labor that both literal and metaphorical images and self-image making play in the social worldings of Sarambavi and Malagasy debates around realness and authenticity, performativity and embodiment that they engender. My research is based on two years of field work, multi-sided field work, and three different sites. First, in a rural polyethnic riverine town um, in the upper Beitsibuka Valley, and secondly, a small regional port city along the Mozambique Channel, and finally, the nation's capital in Tenerife. The dissertation traces the peregrinations of Sarambavi as both a figure and a representation, as a linguistic category and cultural logic that's impregnated with particular sex gender theories, and most importantly, as human lives that are identified and interpolated under its sign. The story that unfolds throughout the dissertation centers around the perplexing and compelling convergence between the burgeoning quote unquote modern LGBT movement in Madagascar and the quote unquote traditional practice of spirit mediumship. Indeed, MSM activism, MSM standing for men who have sex with men, and HIV prevention programming, both backed largely by foreign political actors, have expanded through the quintessentially Malagasy experience of Trumba spirit possession. The dissertation considers the place, among other things, of pilgrimage in the lives of Sarambavi spirit mediums, specifically meditating on the ritualized return to spirit shrines in the Beitsi Buka Valley, but also the comings and, comings and goings that emerged out of their work um, as HIV AIDS peer educators and as people who participate in MSM activism conferences. An experiment in historical ethnography, my dissertation manuscript, um, considers and draws upon queer theories of temporality to reconsider the temporal idioms 
and socio-religio sexual surrender that possession provides for Sarambhavi subjects and the spirits that possess them. So chapters on my dissertation coalesce around an array of figures, um, including a sex worker spirit named Mbutamasaki, a family of mermaid spirits, uh, the Sarambhavi figure as conceived in French colonial medical literature, and the newly emergent medicalized figure of the Malagasy MSM. The dissertation makes several interventions within African studies, a disciplinary formation within which Madagascar and the Western Indian Ocean more generally um, occupies a rather queer position within. In the academic literature on gender nonconforming, excuse me, on nonconforming genders and sexualities in the Global South, including for our purposes here, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, the project tries to move beyond problematic approaches made by an earlier generation of mostly white, gay, and lesbian anthropologists that fetishize and romanticize the ritualized roles of an ahistorical queer native. Simultaneously, however, my project is committed to neither secularizing nor erasing Sarambhavi participation in spirit possession, which is facing increased hostility from Abrahamic traditions on the island. More generally, like the work of um, people like our colleague uh, Kwame Otu, the project participates in the broader struggle to complicate and nuance representations of queer Africa. Finally, within spirit possession studies, the project uh, provides what I'm calling right now a spirit and person-centered methodology um, in which I take seriously the role of spirits as agentive actors, as of course Malagasy mediums do. As noted, one chapter focuses on a sex worker spirit in Butmasak, who has created a network of Sarambhavi mediums and clients. In a social milieu where Sarambhavi describe themselves as living with or without menach, shame, Mbuti Masaki imparts upon her mediums an open and unabashed embrace of sexuality encompassed in her very name, which means she who dares. Through Mbuti Masaki, I consider the local affective contours of shame and the import of homo-nationalist politics as they played out in pride events that were organized by the U.S. Embassy in the nation's capital, Antananarivo. That's all. <laughs> In case this is on, <laughs> um, next I'm going to introduce uh, the wonderful Tony Perry. Good afternoon, everyone. As Seth mentioned, my name is Tony Perry. I come from the Department of American Studies at the University of Maryland College Park. And my dissertation is titled, To Go to Nature's Manufactory, The Material Ecology of Slavery in Antebellum, Maryland. In this work, I examine how what I term the ecology of slavery in the Upper South informed the everyday lives of the enslaved there. This project advances an ecological analysis that privileges various networks of relation between slaves, slaveholders, soils, plants, animals, and weather, cold weather specifically. Grounding my analysis in the everyday world of slavery, my dissertation employs a framework I call material ecology, which draws from material culture studies in that it utilizes object-oriented analysis as a means of thinking through, unpacking, and rendering the ecologies in which I am interested. By analyzing the ecological relationships organized in and around cast iron plows, enslaved people's shoes, charms made and used by slaves, as well as stews and similar one-pot meals, I investigate how slaves and slaveholders in Maryland mobilized elements of their environment against one another in contests over power. I argue that examining the ecological networks involved in these contests illustrates the extent to which enslaved people's relationship to their environment was simultaneously antagonistic and empowering. As the anchor of my first chapter, the cast iron plow as material ecology is a useful starting point, being that its history as an agricultural tool facilitates a discussion of colonial and antebellum Maryland's agro-environmental history. Further, this object, 
organizes specific labor and non-labor based experiences of the enslaved, experiences that mark moments where slaves formed and applied environmental knowledge in a range of cultivated, uncultivated, and built spaces. My second chapter on slave shoes considers the failings of these articles in view of assessing the relationship between the enslaved and cold weather. Here I read the feet of un- and under-provisioned slaves as an index of how they and slaveholders channeled frigid weather for their respective purposes, a narrative that etched itself into the cracked, frostbitten, and sometimes toeless feet of the enslaved. My next chapter on charms destabilizes contemporary notions of the environment as a fusion of nature and culture by highlighting the extent to which enslaved people's environmental world was shaped by natural, cultural, and supernatural phenomena. As charms materially mark the meeting point of the physical and spiritual, they immediately speak to ecological relationships that subsume yet subvert the nature-culture binary. Finally, in my fourth chapter, I foreground how the material ecology of stews and similar one-pot meals speaks to ecological relationships born of slaves supplementing food provisions by growing their own food, procuring edible plants from surrounding woods, as well as by hunting, fishing, and trapping. While much could be said of making such stews, this chapter focuses on the literal consumption of this cultural production, the ingestion of the materialized ecological relations that converged in and around one pot meals. The eating of material ecology, I argue here, uniquely signals the extent to which slaves metabolize their environment into matters of life and wellness, family and community. Beyond expanding analyses of power in slavery studies and developing material ecology as a framework bridging material cultural studies and environmental history, this project, one, provides an extended analysis of American slavery during the winter. It highlights how contemporary conceptions of the environment do not capture the environmental worlds of many slaves. And it also recuperates a politics of bending forces readily found in everyday environments to the advantage of resistance projects. I'm looking forward to my second year here at the Woodson Institute, and I'm confident the coming months will be as intellectually vibrant and energizing as I found last year to be. Thank you all. Next, we will hear from Xavier Pickett. As um, Dr. McDowell began some of our reflections about just the historic sort of um, moment that we find ourselves in at the um, University of Virginia, and particularly the um, Carter G. Woodson Institute of African American Studies and African Studies, um, I want to uh, also note through just kind of the prompting, um, you know, it's just a privilege to be able to stand in the tradition um, of, this, of this institution and also be able to stand in the tradition of someone like Joseph R. Washington who was um, one of the earlier directors of uh, African American studies here in the, in the early 70s, who was also um, a scholar of religion, partly who I take myself to be. <laughs> so let me begin there. James Baldwin said to be a Negro in this country and to be relatively subconscious is to be enraged almost all the time. Is a quote that is probably quite familiar now, but when I began this project, it wasn't. <laughs> to be a Negro in this country and to be relatively self-conscious, to be enraged almost all the time. My dissertation titled Black Irreligious Fire, the Literary and Moral Imagination of James Baldwin and, and James Cone actually attempts to articulate the significance of this insight for the fields of religious studies, literary studies, and philosophy. Black irreligious fire shatters the monochromatic understanding of religion and rage in African-American literature, as well as black theological writings. By attending to the ways in which religious belief, criticism, skepticism are intermingled within African-American literature, this project unveils what I term black irreligion within African-American literature, as well as black theological writings. 
And so through analyzing Baldwin's and Combs' writings, I argue that there is an irreligious vision, a vision that is motivated and sustained by rage and a type of irreligious fire at work in their literary and moral imaginations. As an intervention within literary studies, this project makes visible the undiscovered Baldwin within the form and content of Cone's disciplinary forming black theological project. And it demonstrates how attending to that literary discovery and the relevant literary features, Cone's black theological writings becomes African-American literature and correcting and reconnecting and recasting the role of African-American literature in black theology, I rectify Cone's omission from the discipline of African-American literature by establishing his theological writings as an indispensable part of the discipline. As an intervention within moral and political philosophy, my project examines the affective, ethical, and political impact of African American literature on black theological writings, particularly Combs. It actually reevaluates black rage, which is commonly portrayed as pathological, poisonous to oneself and to one's society. My dissertation attempts to counter such portrayals in order to envision the promises contained within black rage. In particular, it exposes and establishes a less familiar, irreligious rage from within the moral imagination of Cohn and Baldwin. In so doing, it actually offers a more psychology of black rage. Specifically, the project advances not only an ethics of black rage, but also shows how black rage as such is moral and intellectual virtue. In effect, Cone emerges not only as literary writer, but also as moral philosopher. Overall, this project makes explicit the irreligious, affective, and ethical underpinnings of African American literature and the theoretical consequences of such underpinnings for the academic study of black religion in particular, but also for public life as well. This project then unveils how the emotions can unleash political possibilities into various public spheres from faith-based institutions to civic organizations to social movements like Black Lives Matter. It deploys the inner penetration of the literary, religious, and moral resources in a way that can motivate us not only to be good citizens, but also to be insurgent citizens. And so this study holds significance for civic organizations such as the University of Virginia, challenging these institutions to respond ethically to rage that is engulfing the United States and equips um, citizens who are oftentimes disenchanted and activists who are within arm's reach to be able to respond in a much more ethical and politically responsible manner. Thank you. Now, I'd like to introduce my esteemed colleague, Ashley Wade. Being a scholar of technology does not mean that I know how to use it. <laughs> so um, I, my name is Ashley Wade, and I come to you from the Women's and Gender Studies Department at Rutgers University. And my dissertation is called To Be Girl, Digital, and Black, Black Girls' Digital Media Production as Cultural Discourse. And it looks at how black girls in the United States use digital media applications to create visual content like film and photography in order to contribute to conversations about a range of social issues, including those of race, gender, and sexuality. I argue that black girls' digital media productions not only reveal their conceptualizations of race, gender, and sexuality, but also speak to how they both navigate and create spaces through cultural production. My project was born mostly from my work as a high school teacher at an independent all-girls school in Richmond, Virginia. During this time, I served on a task force designed to integrate technology in the classroom. And I was bothered by the disconnection between the enthusiasm to jump on the classroom technology bandwagon and the increased regulation 
and policing around our students' use of cell phones during the school day. I started to realize that the aversion to student cell phone use was mostly driven by gendered assumptions surrounding what students were doing on their cell phones and the unfair expectation that the girls at our school should craft their subjectivities primarily around their roles as students, as if they're not actually people with their own ideas and desires that may or may not have anything to do with school. So I wanted to learn more about what girls were actually doing with their cell phones and the relationships between their cell phone interactions and their sense of self. So, why black girls? That's the question that people always ask me. So, from an anecdotal standpoint, I saw how the black girls at the school where I worked were often overlooked in conversations surrounding educational ownership, meaning feeling like the school community is their own, yet they were over-policed when it came to behavior. And I knew from stories that they told me that they didn't feel that, like there were spaces within the school environment where they could be themselves. And since we talked all the time, they talked to me a lot about their Snapchat activity, even though they never actually let me see any of their snaps. <laughs> and so I was curious about how these digital spaces facilitated a sense of belonging for them that they lacked in school. From a standpoint that's more supported by research, mostly from the Pew Center, um, black teens as a group and girls as a group are among the highest reported users of mobile technologies, especially social media applications like Instagram and Snapchat. But there are a few studies that look at black girls' cell phone usage. And among the studies that do look at black girls' technology use, the approach tends to focus on the impact of consumption making media production an understudied area. If black teens and girls are engaging with social media the most, we should not only be asking what they're consuming, but what are they making and sharing, and what might these products illustrate about how they engage the world around them. I'm learning so much from the girls who are a part of this research. Their eagerness to participate and willingness to share their experiences inspire me and serve as a constant reminder for why this work needs to be done. My project advances the field of African American studies through complicating narratives about the relationship between blackness and digital technologies. My work positions black people, specifically black girls, as technological innovators. And in this way, my project both aligns with established theories about the role of cultural production in black socio-political struggles and invites us to consider how the digital opens up new possibilities for black liberation frameworks. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll have Dion Bailey. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, my name is Dion Bailey and I am a first year postdoctoral fellow at the Woodson Institute, and I earned uh, my PhD um, in history from the University of Mississippi. In an article published on August the 31st, 1896, in the Denver Evening Post, the headlines read, a young criminal, she is a murderess at nine years old and goes to the pen. The short but intriguing tale of Hetty Record related to the Mississippi justice system at the end of the 19th century is only one small if poignant story, but it reveals the business of black women's bodies during imprisonment and in freedom. In 1896, the state of Mississippi convicted nine-year-old Hetty Record of Holly Springs, Mississippi of the murder of her infant two-year-old niece, of accused of smothering her infant relative and burying the baby in the backyard, Record became the youngest person at that time to be convicted of manslaughter in the state of Mississippi. Record's conviction meant that she would serve 10 years imprisonment in the state penitentiary, which at that time was unheard of because prior to that, two white women Wright had been convicted of manslaughter and they were only sentenced to one year. 
After having served close to 10 years of her sentence, the story of Hetty Record takes a stunning turn. A white judge and his business partner, a plantation owner, wrote a series of pardon or clemency requests to the governor requesting a pardon not only for record but for other imprisoned African American women. The motives of the judge and the planter speak to larger issues surrounding the value that whites placed on black women's bodies and their primary interest in record lay in the value of her labor, even at such a young age. Well, by this time, she's almost 19. In the South, white men often exploited African American women through their laboring and sexualized bodies with few social or political ramifications. In the case of Record, these two white men sought to use the carceral state in an, in to, in an aid to legitimize their efforts to extract labor and enrich themselves. At the core, my book manuscript tentatively titled, Please Don't Forget About Me, African American Women, Mass Incarceration, and the Business of Black Women's Bodies in the American South, 1890 to 1980, examines the complex and often overlooked history of the imprisonment of African American women in the South and more specifically in Mississippi. And this work is a direct um, uh, conversation to David Oshinsky's book, Down on Par uh, Worse Than Slavery, and another book, um, Down on Parchment Farm, which both write, exclude, almost exclude women from the narrative. This manuscript will illustrate the broader political, social, and legal systems of rampant exploitation that black women face due to their race and gender at the hands of a Southern society that profited from their punishment and labor. This research places women at the center of the United States political economy and illustrates how Southern states, including Mississippi, shaped their public policies and laws to exploit black women's labor and their sexuality. It builds on the works of notable scholars who explore the consequences of both economic and social exploitation of black women. Furthermore, it explores the cultural and political consequences of being black, female, and criminal, not only in a racist penal system, but also in a society that places little value on the lives of African Americans. And this is what I call the multiple jeopardy. What, and this is what uh, incarcerated African American, uh, African American women endured, that was being black, female, criminal, poor, mothers, right? This is all the jeopardy that they found themselves in. So please don't forget about me, also traces the growth of the American penal system from the 19th throughout the 20th century, led in part by the mass incarceration of African Americans to illustrate that people of color continually experienced a marked set of justice that aided in their criminalization. First, by placing African-American women as major actors in the carceral state, my work illustrates that race, along with class and gender, significantly influenced how peniology functioned in the South. This work points out that beginning in the 1880s, the South developed a unique system of domestic parole, and which is characterized by states' continued interest in the controlled and monitored labor of black women. The Mississippi justice system effectively adopted this system and its racist ideologies of gender, labor, and space to criminalize African American women. The state viewed African Americans as a dangerous class in need of control and believed that black women were lewd, unwomanly, sexually deviant, and criminal by nature. Often deemed unimportant, incarcerated people have attracted the attention of scholars focused on inequality and injustice in the U.S. institutions and structures. And this work draws attention not only to incarceration, but also to the interlocking roles of race and gender in the U.S. economy, polity, and society.
Please Don't Forget About Me then investigates the labor and sexual exploitation within the prison system and shatters the so-called state-imposed notions of sexual deviance of African-American women both outside and within the prison walls. The manuscript also uh, contextualizes federal and state judicial systems that criminalize women who were raped, unwed mothers, and those in same-sex relationships. And finally, the manuscript will show that policymakers at Parchman Penitentiary constructed to, uh, constructed to function as a penal farm the, the use and labor of African-American women and also men to profit the state. Ne and they never had any qualms about inter incarcerating African-American women where many times they would get together and discuss reasons why not to incarcerate white women, no matter what they did. Reminiscent of the old Southern plantations in the South, the labor of black women was vital to the success of the penal farm and to the state, and they would prove that throughout the 20th century, they were very invested in black women's bodies. Thank you. Now it is my honor to introduce Julius Lennon. Okay, um, good evening everyone. Hi. Julius. Hi. <laughs> uh, I am Julius Fleming uh, Jr. and I'm currently an assistant professor of English at the University of Maryland College Park and a second year postdoctoral fellow here in the Woodson. Um, and at the outset, I'd like to thank you all for coming out and also say thank you to Dr. McDowell and to my Woodson family. And I think um, for me seeing these brilliant presentations alongside Dr. McDowell, um, grabbing the little one and taking it outside really says something about the dynamics I found here um, at the Woodson that is both characterized by rigor um, but also a kind of family support that I think is both rare and uh, quite revolutionary. On Saturday, August 9, 2014, 18-year-old Michael Brown, a black male teenager, was fatally shot by Darren Wilson, a white police officer in Ferguson, Missouri. For about four hours, Brown's body, as the New York Times reported, quote, remained face down in the middle of the street. A crowd of mostly black residents began to assemble and to grow increasingly perturbed. According to Ferguson committee woman Patricia Bynes, quote, the delay helped fuel the outrage. When interviewed by then mayor, or when interviewed, the then mayor of St. Louis, Francis G. Slay, explained that his city, quote, had a very specific policy for handling such situations. Quote, about 80% of the time, he noted, the body is generally taken away immediately. And if the body remains at the scene, we'll block off the area and do the investigation as quickly as we can. Neither happened for Mike Brown. Rather, his body, even in death, was forced into a vile performance of what I call black patience. That is, a violent and racialized economy of time that has historically produced black suffering by coercing black bodies to wait, by regulating the movement of black matter through the space-time of global modernity. As I demonstrate in my first book project, the deep history of black patients spans from the dungeon of the slave castle to the hold of the slave ship, from waiting on the auction block to lingering on the edge of emancipation. And to this, we could also add contemporary mass incarceration with black bodies waiting there. We could think about the increasing number of trauma centers that are being closed in black and, and neighborhoods of color with poor people. Um, so this logic of black patients spans right from slavery to the contemporary moment. Titled Black Patients, Performance in the Civil Rights Movement, uh, my book studies the social, cultural, and political logics of black patients. To do so, it examines a transnational archive of black theater and performance that emerged during the Civil Rights Movement, a period known for its unrelenting critiques of black patients, its creative demands for freedom now. In the book, I make four key arguments. First, I argue that theater, like photography and television, was a vital genre of civil rights activism. It afforded constituencies around the world a means of seeing, hearing, experiencing, and building a movement. Whereas theater remains marginalized in cultural and political histories of the movement, my book recuperates a transnational archive of black theater and restores black theatrical performance to this phase of the black freedom struggle. 
Secondly, the book posits black patients as a key hermeneutic for analyzing what scholars have come to term the afterlives of slavery, which is to say, quote, the skewed life chances that continue to animate black life in the wake of emancipation. My book advances this scholarship by proffering black patients as a new analytic for theorizing the afterlives of slavery. To this end, it uses the racial history and the political economy of time and space to make sense of the vast network of relations that continue to shape black life in the wake of transatlantic slavery. Thirdly, I intervene in performance studies discourses by arguing for the importance of embodied philosophy to black performance theory in particular and to black studies more broadly. In the plays that I examine throughout the book, I analyze how black artists and activists, some with only an eighth grade education, use their bodies to craft sophisticated philosophical perspectives on race, politics, time, and space, whether performing Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot in the cotton fields of Mississippi or staging sit-ins that put the act of waiting or the embodied performance of patience in the service of black freedom dreams. Additionally, rather than lament the ephemeral, present-oriented character of performance, as is common in performance studies discourse, black patience theorizes this elusiveness, this proclivity toward disappearance, as a vital dimension of the politics and aesthetics of the here and now that color the cultural and political fronts of the modern civil rights movement. Finally, Black patients responds to a recent critical term now called the Long Civil Rights Movement Framework. According to advocates of this school of thinking, focusing on the short civil rights movement, which is to say 1954 to 1968, obscures the movement's earlier, more radical dimensions. Therefore, these scholars shift the movement's origins to the 1930s and 1940s. Rather than make an about face away from the movement's classical phase, my book lingers in the break of the classical period. It argues that the dilemma of implotting radical civil rights history and of theorizing radicalism more broadly is not primarily one of periodization. Instead, it is both a problem of the archive, privileging television and photography and not attending to theater, and of permitting conventional notions of radicalism to guide these efforts. In the final analysis, Black Patience argues that black theater furnishes the kind of radical, political, and philosophical depth scholars have found wanting in the short phase of the movement. And it makes a case for more critically attending to black patients as the structuring social and political logic of time and space structuring African slavery and its afterlives in the contemporary moment. Thank you. Trajectory 
from range to outrage. And looking at the shift from apparently destructive aggression to constructive aggression. Yeah, no, uh, that's precisely. Um, is that, is that an, ethic? an ethic of making that description possible? Okay. Yeah, no, that's no, precisely the right. You can probably say it better than me. Um, yeah, um, there's a certain kind of word that I have that we just kind of ad hoc sort of understanding of that rage is um, immediately just kind of already just problematic, already sort of pathological. And so that actually forecloses any sort of like real thoroughgoing sort of analysis of actually what it is and what, what it actually might contain and what it might can actually unleash. And so um, because the general sort of like mainstream sort of studies, you know, the earlier sort of stuff from like Hobbes and Greer, like black rage and, and from um, close to sort of like rage of the, um, the middle class, um, you know, it's just kind of basically, it just flattens out to kind of psychological sort of problem. So I'm intervening and saying, well, actually, as, as opposed to just thinking about this thing as psychological, actually, there might be other categories in which we can understand rage. So and primarily, I'm thinking about it literar literarily, but also morally, right? And so, um, and trying to offer essentially a theory of rage. And so something that we actually don't possess, but we think we know what it is. So, so, so by offering a theory, I'm trying to actually defamiliarize ourselves with the very thing we think we know. Because we actually don't know what it is. And so, yeah, so I'll just say this last thing. The worries that we, the fact that we think we know what it is creates the sort of worries and anxieties that we don't want it. Why? Because it's, it's presumably destructive. And I want to say, well, if it's really destructive, and if we, already, because if we already know what it is and if we think it's destructive, then why haven't we seen this country destroyed by black people who've been enraged? Mm -hmm. Right, so, is that, so in this way, I don't want to give too much of the distinction away. This way, actually, <laughs> you know, um, in this way, like black rage actually becomes a miracle, right? And so, like, we actually should be thanking black people, like they're, that they are rage because it actually preserves. And so, the black rage actually end up preserving the very sort of condition in which we find ourselves by making possible black patience in the civil rights movement that's, that's on the long side of this thing that continues people struggling and pushing forward to try to, you know, um, maintain some semblances, which is really a semblance of democracy. Thank you, thank you, uh, Xavier. Anybody else? Any questions, comments, questions? So, uh, Lindsay Jones, uh, you study on non-physical punishment. You're doing it at the height of the eugenics movement. And you, University of Virginia, as well as Virginia, are really leading the way with a lot of legislation and policies that are confining particularly wayward girls and the black space. How much are you delving into the eugenics policies and how you're looking at <coughs> the institution? So, um, from what I've seen, eugenics policies mainly were um, leveled against white girls and women, um, but they were part and parcel of this, this ethic around uh, sexual and social control in Virginia, particularly in like the 19 teens and the 1920s when we see the, the Virginia Eugenics Act actually come into play. So uh, one, one policy that the state put forward, uh, particularly during the, the 1920s, was that in any state-run institution that is the insane asylums, the uh, reformatories, the penitentiary, you know, local jails, anything, uh, inmates uh, or institutionalized people uh, would be tested for uh, venereal diseases, um, which in the case of the institution that I studied were highly prevalent among the, the girls institutionalized there. And so while, while we don't see uh, ster eugenic sterilization among the population that I study, uh, we do see uh, this concern with reproduction, this concern with uh, adolescent sexual exploration and curtailing um, the sexual freedom of uh, adolescent girls and young women. Thank you. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Well, although I've been asked to retain people in this room, I think we could do well to go out into the lobby. I can't imagine what has happened. <laughs> They've been here since like 3.30, so they could have prepared the feast that came. 